Okay, we are on the record. It is 9.30 and it is July 21st, 2022. We are here for the sentencing hearing in People of the State of Colorado versus Kevin Dean Eastman, Will County case number 20CR461. I can please have the lawyers identify themselves for the record. Steve Wren and Yvette Guthrie on behalf of the prosecution. And you are joined with? Justin Atwood and Joe Porter. Thank you. Samantha Devereaux on behalf of Mr. Eastman. And Ashley Morris on Thank behalf you. of Mr. Eastman. Mr. Eastman appears in custody. Before we go any further, Mr. Wren, did you want to make a record regarding compliance with the Victims' Rights Act? We are in compliance with the Victims' Rights Act, Your Honor. Uh, Stan Sessions is present in the courtroom. Alex McLaughlin and possibly some of his brothers uh, are on their way in, I understand, and uh, will be uh, appearing in the courtroom as well. I'll be glad to wait for them if they're going to be here momentarily. Last I heard, they were about five or seven minutes out. So I, I think we can get started, but uh, they will, uh, at least Alex does wish to address the court, and I'll call him up uh, when he gets here. Okay, thank you. So I would like to explain to everybody how we're going to conduct this sentencing hearing. And so the prosecution will have an opportunity first to present evidence that they have. And they can present evidence through, for example, witness statements. If you are going to be speaking at the sentencing hearing, you could speak from the podium. You will not be subject to cross-examination. After the prosecution presents evidence, then the defense, if they wish, will have an opportunity to present any evidence that they have for this sentencing hearing. The prosecution then will have an opportunity to make a statement on behalf of the prosecution. The defense will have an opportunity to make a statement. Mr. Eastman, you have the right to or not to make a statement on your own behalf. And then the court will impose the sentence in this case. Okay? And Mr. Red, do you have any individuals who would like to speak uh, on behalf of the prosecution, yes, on behalf of the victims. Yes. I would like to start by inviting Stan Sessions up to the podium. Good morning, Mr. Sessions. Good morning, it's, Your Honor. It's finally very nice to be able to speak to you face to face. It, yes, it is. Thank you. I just wanted to fill in a few blanks, and I wanted to Mr. Eastman to know the consequences of his actions, that he can maybe roll around in his head, maybe he can figure out a way to become a, a better person. I've lived 82 years, I think I have some experience. When he took Scott's life, he started a chain reaction that I'm sure he doesn't know anything about. Scott's mother was lying in a nursing home in North Glen, uh, expected to live not very long. And you can imagine, and I don't mean to be selfish, I just as an illustration, you can imagine what it was like for me to go have to go tell her on her deathbed that her son had been murdered. Her response was, who, who would kill my Scotty? She never mentioned another word. She lived two more months and passed away. He deprived her of telling him goodbye and he telling her goodbye. The essence of the phone call he made to me as he was going to the invitation he had received to come over was, Dad, are you going to go down and see Mom in the morning? I said, yes, I am. He said, Good, I'll go with you. Oh, there's the address. I've got to sign off now. I'll see you tomorrow. 
That was, a, that was the phone call. That's what it was about, still thinking about his dying mother. Now, that fills in the, what went on in that telephone call to me and the aftermath. So what he did, Mr. Eastman did, is he caused our family, two of us left now, Steve, my son, myself, the most anguish that you can ever impose upon a family. Now, Scotty wasn't perfect, none of us are, but he loved his family. It pained my heart to hear the concocted story of him raping somebody. Never, ever, ever, ever in 54 years ever had a complaint like that in his life. He was not that kind of guy. I want to thank the jury for seeing through. I understand the system, and I'm not critical of it, Judge. I'm just observing and pouring my heart out to the court today. COVID came in there and really threw us a nasty curve or two. We couldn't hold funerals. And we had planned a big memorial. We had over 500 people RSVP'd to a memorial service in March that wanted to come from all over Eastern, well, all over the Front Range, Wyoming. And sadly, we had to cancel that. So some of the people who are here today are here, are here for the sole purpose of a little bit of a positive memory. So I'm grateful for that. Now, at the, at finally, I am truly a Christian man. Believe in the Gospels of Christ completely. I live by the admonition, it is for us not to judge, that that's, that's the job of the great creator, to judge. With that, it's incumbent upon me the last two years to find a way to forgive this man for what he did, because I don't want to carry his burden on my shoulders. I will not let him or anyone else determine my happiness for the rest of my life. So Mr. Eastman, I have no quarrel with you. I hope and pray that you'll take advantage of the services of the prison system, that you will find, you'll find God in your life and that you will find a way to to become a better person, you still have a chance, but that's not up to us. And with this, I thank the court. Thank you personally, Judge Kopkow and all of your staff. The jury did a marvelous job, I think, and the detectives, my goodness. I was told by of the, of the finding of the body by Detective Atwood. What a marvelous man he is. That was almost a sacred few minutes that we shared together. I was later informed that he and as many as a dozen of the employees of the Larimer County Sheriff's Department worked nonstop around the clock that whole week to identify, I believe they placed the tracking device on that car within a couple of days of finding the body. And last but not least, I would like to praise the snowplow driver who I saw that that was unusual to see a whiff of smoke up there, got out in the freezing cold, sub-zero weather and climbed up that hill we might never have known otherwise what happened to our son. And I'm missing some people, and I know, but thanks to all of you, and I, 
I will be fine. I will move on, and I have, and uh, we'll all move on. So again, from my heart, thank you. I believe deeply in my heart that the right decisions were made. Thank you. Mr. Session, on, on behalf of the state of Colorado, our condolences for the loss of your son. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your Honor, next, I believe Allison Weldon, who is on WebEx, uh, wishes to address the court. I am, I have not had an opportunity to meet her, but I, I was informed this morning that uh, she would like to speak, and she is Scott's biological sister. Thank you. Ms. Weldon, I just unmuted you on WebEx. Can you hear me okay? This is Judge Kupkow. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I can. And just for the record, her last name is spelled W-E-L-D-O-N. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. And you are Scott's biological sister? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, what would you like to say? Thank you. Sorry, a little bit emotional. Um, I didn't get enough time with my brother. Um, Nobody gets enough time. My spirit pressure. When I look at my son, I see my brother. Um, my heart goes out to Stan and everybody else. I know that Scott smiled the whole entire universe. It was very infectious. And he will be greatly missed. I always wanted a brother. And for a while, I didn't know I had a brother. But for some reason, Scott always knew something was wrong. And I didn't have to say anything. He would call. And we had a connection that I just can't even explain. And he with me. There's tons of signs. He's still here with me. But I guess I'm selfish and I just didn't get enough time. But I appreciate being able to state how I feel, even though I sound like a mess. And I wish the family that is there. I'm wrapping my arms around all of you, and I know we're not all of you, and I hope everybody soon. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weldon. I'm sorry for your loss. We appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much. I would have been there, but I have a full set of patients today. <laughs> So, thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Sharon, we have several friends and, and former bandmates of Scott Sessions. Uh, first, I'd call up Shelly Kelly. Good morning. <clears throat> I'd just have you state your name and spell your last name. My name is Shelly Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y. Before I begin this morning, I, I want you to know that we recognize, I recognize that there are two victims who needlessly lost their lives. I only know one of them, but my standing here today talking about my friend, my bandmate, um, does not take away the value that Heather's life had as well, and I acknowledge her. Music, it is the voice of the soul. When it speaks, everyone listens. I've had the honor of making music with Scott Sessions for many years. I want to give you some insight into the music of Scott Sessions. We spoke the unique language of music together. 
Scotty and I were bandmates, and Scotty and I were friends. We spoke that unique language. Scotty always had the rock and roll tunes down pat. But then the band decided we were going to start doing gospel music and give that a try. I'll not soon forget the look on Scotty's face when we started discussing performing, much less making an album of gospel music. Scotty played, literally played along with this idea, but it was clear that he was not sure what he was in for. He and the rest of the brass section would not just play the music, but they began choreographing dance moves for tunes such as Swing Low Sweet Chariot, I'm Saved, Walk Them Golden Stairs, How Great Thou Art, and many others. Scotty and the brass section brought a smile to the faces of band members and countless audiences alike with his special band moves to the gospel songs. He brought a whole new dimension to our stage and our performances. He would take an ordinary song and light it up. It became extraordinary when Scotty played it. There was a profound empty spot on the stage of our performance on February 10th. 2020, and that spot will forever remain empty on our stage. Scotty was a stranger to no one. He made friends quickly and would give you the shirt off his back, a melody for your soul, and most of all, a smile that would warm the hardest of hearts. So many grieve the loss of Scotty, but we know he's at rest and is playing beautiful music with the trumpet and the angels, and they are loving it just as we all did. His music was such a blessing. We are grateful for the many recordings of Scotty and his magical trumpet that he left behind, but we will be able to enjoy those recordings for the rest of our lives. What a gift. He made his mark. He left music and memories that will forever, that will never be forgotten or ever silenced. Scotty's music, the voice of Scotty's soul, will live on forever and will continue to speak to anyone who chooses to listen. Next, Your Honor, if I could invite up George Gray. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, my name is George Gray, G-R-A-Y. Um, I guess the, the, the first name of George Gray and Elvis Experience Band that Scott, uh, we had the honor of having Scott with us on him. I just wanted to start by saying that, um, you know, the defense did what they were supposed to do by representing and protecting the rights of the accused. Their goal was to cast doubt, introduce their own evidence, and or attack the prosecution's evidence, bring their own witnesses, and introduce theories. Sometimes, and we've heard this, this trial, there's attacks on the victim's character, as if to maybe justify the death. Scott did not deserve that. As for Scott, he wasn't perfect. He was an amazing trumpet player, fun, caring, a good friend, and a goofball. He sometimes ran late for rehearsal, but always made it. And that Monday night when he didn't show up for a concert, wasn't like him. His father and I met at his house Tuesday morning to find it empty and signs show that he hadn't been there all weekend. I suggested to Stan that he reach out to law enforcement agencies and hospitals in Fort Collins and the Greeley area. Little did we know that Scott's remains were being discovered and being processed a day earlier. Scott was a son and a brother. And we hear the saying that a parent should never have to bury their child, just like a community should never have to lose a person like Scott, especially in the way that he did. To tell you the truth, I never thought this day would come, but God is good. It's been a long fight, it's been a hard fight, but God is good and justice will be served. I take comfort in knowing that 99% of us in this room will leave to go back to our families, living free, travel wherever we want, and to love and to be loved. Thank you. Thank you, 
Mr. Gray. People would invite up Edward Gavelman. Mr. Gavin, it's good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, Judge, uh, I, I appear today as a, as a musician, not an attorney. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I've known Scott since he played three years with a band called After the Fire that I was involved in. Played five years with the Movers and Shakers. He lived in Greeley, I lived in Fort Collins. We rode together to um, 60 plus gigs a year for five years. 20,000 miles a year for five years. Um, I'm here to talk about Scott, the musician. He, he was obviously very talented. Scott, was abil his ability to hear a song in the radio and tell you what key it was, was amazing. In my years of playing in bands for some 50 some years, I could hardly even hear the song, let alone tell you what key it was in. But he was truly gifted. But more than that, Judge, he was really a people person. We'd go to gigs, and he'd be talking to a guy that would own a company in Fortune 500, and then he'd be talking to somebody who didn't even have a home to, a home to live in. And he treated them with respect and um, kindness and gave them his full attention. And many times, we'd be packing up, time to leave, and Scott would be talking to the cook or the man who was the janitor who was going to clean up after the band left. He was truly a kind heart. And um, he, he, he had this innate ability to make everybody feel important. When he talked to people, they, they knew that he was genuinely talking to them and he cared about them. So he was a very, very, very special person and a very special musician. And, and without, without going too deep into it, he was, uh, we were able to play together in a horn section in which we had to play either the same notes or harmonizing notes. And towards the end, we were able to do things uh, that was innate, that, that we didn't even rehearse. But we were able to come up with, with things and, and music. And it, it was a, he was a true talent judge. And he will sorely be missed. And, and I just hope that someday I get to play with him again in that great, great band in the sky. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Stevens. Good morning. Good morning. Please just have you state your name and spell your last name. Okay, Laura K. Stevens, S T E V E N S. Thank you. Yes. Um, I didn't really rehearse <laughs> what I wanted to say, so I'm just coming from the heart. Um, I met Scott through music. Um, he played with After the Fires, Eddie mentioned, and we just connected through that, and we ended up in a relationship for five years. And it had ups and downs, but he was so loving, kind, and very protective. Um, we ended the relationship and became very good friends afterwards. And uh, just an example of his character, um, I believe I was the last person to see him alive. I was house-sitting for Stan, taking care of his house and his dog Clifford, who I love. And um, Scott came over to see how things were going. And I fixed him breakfast. We spent the whole day together. Um, I got the stomach flu while he was there. He went out, got ginger ale, sauteing crackers, and uh, took care of me the whole day. And then, you know, I, I was starting to fall asleep. He kissed me on the cheek. And um, we told each other we loved each other. And, um, so when Stan called me to tell him he tell me he was missing, I just had that awful feeling in my chest that, oh no, something's really wrong because he would never ever miss a gig. Um, 
but I, I just, he, he just <laughs> was so full of joy, and people have talked about his smile. It was so infectious. And the, day, the last day I saw him, he showed up in this wild purple shirt that had all these designs on it. He was so proud of it, he couldn't wait to show me this purple shirt, so I took a picture of him. And I'm so grateful um, that I did that. Um, but he, like for Christmas, our first year together, he didn't get me perfume or flowers or anything like a lot of men would. He got me, I opened it up, he got me a shovel, a little red shovel, um, battery cables, uh, the spray, you know, you spray on your car windows so you don't have to wipe the ice off. And at first I thought, what the heck is this? But I got, I got him as, as we spent more time together. He was just so protective of me and, and everybody in his family. And I love Scott's family so much. I'm very close to them. I, I took care of Linda, his mom, for six weeks before she passed away. And that was really hard. But she and I went through Scott's things and picked out things um, that she wanted to keep. And it was just very, very precious. Um, so I just am going to miss him terribly. Thank you. Oh, I had to say one more thing. <laughs> After I found out that he had been murdered, um, Justin Atwood called me, and I went in to talk with him. And um, he was so kind to me and supportive um, because I was terrified. I thought maybe I was a suspect in the whole thing. So I do want to say something to him and just, I, I guess that's it. And thank you for listening and for the time. Invite Ray Beamer to the podium, please. Good morning. Just have you start off by stating your name and spelling your last name. Lorraine Beamer, B E A M E R. Thank you. Scotty was a dear friend of mine. I met him 12 years ago after I got divorced in the singles group. And to repeat what other people have said, he had such an infectious smile. But not just a smile, his whole aura was of joy. He was the friendliest of people. And I considered him such a close friend. But I must say that I think everybody who knew him considered him a close friend. He had smiles for everyone, and such joy emanated. And just as other people mentioned earlier, it didn't matter who you were. He was your friend. He always helped everyone everywhere he went. He volunteered for different community projects. I got to volunteer with him. He helped his friends wherever he could. He helped strangers wherever he could. And the world has lost a very unique soul. There are not many people in this world that you come across who have such an impact on everyone they meet. He was so passionate about everything he did, passionate about his music. And I have such memories of all the the musical gigs he would invite me to because he was so excited. So every time he had a gig, he would let everybody know and he would text me and tell me, please come, we're gonna be in Fort Collins today. We're gonna be in Greeley. You can make it, it's close. And I kind of regret not making it to every single one of those. But I love that he loved it so much that when I had a birthday a few years ago, he came with his trumpet and played and brought such joy to everybody who was there, but especially me. I felt so special that he would share his talent. And the world is going to miss such a great person. I am just starting to grieve 
I think because of COVID, because we never got to have a memorial for him, it's been hard. And as we've been waiting, and the trial has been delayed and delayed, it's been very difficult to wait to see what the outcome would be. And I'm grateful that the attorneys were able to show the jury and that they were able to bring to light the actual things that happened to my dear friend. I'm very saddened to hear that the things that the defense had to bring up or had to say to try to defend their client because Scott would never do the things that he was accused of. And it was very painful to hear those types of things because like I said, he was the kindest person you would ever, ever meet. And honestly, had he ever met the defendant, he would have probably tried to help him but he never had that opportunity. I am a person who believes in kindness and forgiveness. And I, like Stan, do forgive Mr. Eastman. But I don't and won't forget the impact that he has, that has happened to, what he has done to Scotty and to Heather. And I do ask that we don't forget that and that we have justice for my dear friend. Thank you. If I can invite up Charlene Schumann. Morning. I'll just have you start off by telling us your name and spelling your last name. Charlene Schenemann, and it's S C H E N E M A N. Thank you. Scott, so where do we start? It, you met Scott, as everyone said, you were his friend. He would always remember your name. He always had a smile on his face, and when he walked into the room, everyone would notice and gather around him. He had a charismatic side to him. People always drawn to him. For Scott's early beginnings, he learned about service. Sorry. <laughs> From Scott's early beginnings, he learned about service. He served as a Boy Scout and then later went on a mission for two years to Australia for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He loved serving in his church as a Sunday school teacher. He was always very helpful to his family and friends. He was a member of the singles group in his church. On a couple of occasions, Scott was known to help young men. A friend had reached out to him whose son was going down the wrong path, and Scott reached back and became a mentor to him. I also remember a single church activity where my son was trying to canoe, and he was having a struggle with it, and Scott was there to help him learn how. And then later he went and got another, he grabbed his own canoe and paddled out to him so they could do some more and go out on the lake. At one of my first singles activities, Scott made the comment for a few friends of ours to always take a picture together. So it became a tradition where we, we would all take pictures while we were together. He was always a friend you could count on to be there and he was always just a phone call away. Scott had a playful side. He loved doing outside activities. He loved hiking with friends, paddleboarding, and going on rides on his motorcycle. Scott had a passion for music. He loved playing his trumpet. Friends would love to go and listen to him and his different bands. The most recent one was the Movers and the Shakers and also the Elvis Impressions with George. He once went to a friend's party, birthday party and that Loray talked about that. It was her birthday party, and that just meant the world to her, and it's a beautiful member that she will always have. It's the only one that she's going to have now. He loved learning of new bands and going to see them, and then he would always learn more about that band, and so when you would ask him questions about it, he always could tell you a whole lot about that band. 
And when I was talking to friends about Scott the past few weeks, some of the words that came out were, he was jack of all trades. He had childlike and he was silly. Loved music and new bands. He worked uh, um, as security for the Stampede for a few years. He was a ray of sunshine. Some of the things we will miss is his infectious laugh, his music, the sound of his trumpet, his loyalty, random funny texts that were always off the wall, his silly side, his smile, his great hugs. And he was always, again, a phone call away and his big, big heart. Scott will greatly be missed by everyone who knew him. He will always be remembered as the trumpet man, the heart of a person who loved all those he met. I was always, I always think of Scott every time I hear a trumpet playing. Now he would be playing his trumpet inside the pearly gates. Scott, fly high and keep playing your, your, your beautiful music. We, we, always have, we have this from here. Thank you. This time we'll shift gears a little bit and invite up uh, friends and family of Heather Frank, starting with Alex McLaughlin, if I may. Good morning. Good to see you again. Nice to see you. Well, I'll just have you, for the record, state your name and spell your last name. It's Alexander McLaughlin, M-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. Thank you. First off, I would like to thank the jurors, prosecutors, and everyone who stepped up to help bring justice for my mother and Scott Sessions. My mom was more than just my mom. She was my best friend. The memories we had together at will cherish forever. I miss her every day, and will continue to miss her every day. Not only was she a mother, she was a daughter, a sister, and a friend to many. She was loving, funny, crazy, and down to earth to many and myself. I have to stay strong and continue moving forward because I know that's what she'd want for me. She will always be with me and would only want the best for me. And for that reason, I'm standing here today to say, Kevin, I'm not for I have not forgiven you yet. Eventually, I will forgive you because that's the kind of person I am. I no longer have hate for you, just disappointment that you decided to do the unimaginable act that took not only my mother's life, but the life of Scott Sessions as well. I pray that one day you will come to the realization of what you've done. I would lastly like to say that my heart and prayers and condolences go out to the family and many friends of Scott Sessions. Thank you. Alex, your mom would be proud of you. Thank you. And our condolences on behalf of the state of Colorado. Thank you. Next, Your Honor, I would invite Lindsay, who I believe is on WebEx with us, uh, to make a statement to the court. Uh, Lindsay is Heather's niece. Thank you. Ms. Frank, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I'm going to have you just state your name and spell your first name and your last name. Yes, my name is Lindsay Frank. That's L-I-N-D-S-Y. Last name F-R-A-N-K. Thank you. Glad you could join us. What would you like to say? Um, well, I would like to start off by saying, as the prosecution mentioned, that I am Heather Frank's niece. Um, I would like to give my condolences to the family and friends of Mr. Scott Sessions. I did not know Mr. Sessions, but from what I read, he was a beloved musician. Um, and after everything I've heard today, I'm confident that his memory and music will live on through everyone he touched. I will always remember my aunt as the fun loving outgoing person that she was. Her boys were her world. It makes me sad to know that she dealt with domestic abuse for many, many years. Yet somehow through it all, she still managed to be a bright light for others. 
I'm sad for my family. My cousins lost their mother. She won't be with them through life's ups and downs. My grandmother died with the heartache of losing a child. My mom and my uncle lost their sister. My uncle's children lost their aunt. I lost my aunt. She will never get to meet my son. My aunt's light will continue to shine in each of us and all of those that she touched. No amount of words can put into perspective the magnitude of loss experienced by everyone involved. To Kevin, I've wrapped my brain over the many things I could say to or about you, but then I realized you don't deserve that much of my time. So I will only say this, you are a coward and you deserve to spend the rest of your life behind bars. Thank you to the detectives, the prosecution, the judge, the jury, and everyone involved in this trial who ensured justice was served. And thank you to the court for allowing me to speak. That's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Frank. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Your Honor, that concludes the people who wish to address the court on behalf of the prosecution. Thank you. Ms. Devereaux, anybody who would like to speak on behalf of your client? No, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wright, anything you'd like to say on behalf of the prosecution? Yes, Your Honor. I'm not going to say a lot. I've, I've said enough over the last several weeks, and I want the words of Scott Sessions' family and Heather Frank's family and friends to, to be the focus here because that's where it should be on their loss, on the devastation that Kevin Eastman has brought to them and this community. I'm asking the court to impose consecutive sentences as to all counts and the maximum penalty permitted by the law as to each count. I'm asking the court to give the prosecution uh, an appropriate period of time to file restitution and I want to also thank the jury for their work in this case. We asked a lot of them and took them away from their families and their commitments and their jobs uh, for a lengthy period of time. And uh, this system that we believe in that is capable of bringing justice only works um, when people like them commit to it. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful for their service. Uh, there's, there's one last thing I want to leave the court with. Uh, last night after the verdict, I was provided with a, a short video. It's, it's like a minute that I, I would like to play. I would ask the court's indulgence for just a moment. Uh, as the court has heard repeatedly uh, throughout the trial, as well as today, Scott Sessions was a, a gifted musician. Uh, music was at the center of his life. And uh, I would like to play a short video and, and wrap this case up on that note, if I may. Stevens provided that to me and explained to me that she and Scott would go to the cemetery in Windsor every Memorial Day and he would do that to honor the dead. Uh, there's an element of honoring him and Heather today. Thank you. Ms. 
Debra, anything you'd like to say on behalf of your client? Yes, Judge. Judge, um, Ms. Morris and I and Mr. Vontes have worked with Mr. Eastman now for over two years. Um, and we just wanted to tell the court that from the bottom of our hearts, it's been an honor and privilege to represent Kevin. We have gotten to know him very well. And through our representation of him, he has been nothing but kind, respectful, patient, compassionate, warm-hearted, and oftentimes, most of the times, has put our well-being before his own. I just wish, and I know Ms. Morris and Mr. Vontes does too, that um, everyone in the room could have gotten to know the Kevin that we knew. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Eastman, you don't have to say anything. Is there anything you would like to say? Mr. Eastman does not wish to make a statement at this time. Thank, Thank you. you. So the court has considered the verdicts of the jury. The court has considered the statements that were made um, by family members and friends today. Listening to everybody, what comes to mind immediately is that there were two direct victims in this case, but they were dozens of indirect victims of the loss of these two lives as demonstrated by many of your statements today. So to say there was two victims is certainly an understatement. There were dozens of victims based on the actions of Mr. Eastman. I also don't want to have the focus on what this court has to say because I don't want to minimize what the victims and family and friends have said today. But what I will say, Mr. Eastman, is that you are going to spend the rest of your natural life in prison based on your vicious acts of violence, jealousy, and control, and the taking of two precious lives, and thereafter disposing of their deceased bodies in such a disrespectful manner. That's why you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. As it relates to count number one, with regard to murder in the first degree as it relates to Scott Sessions, the court is going to sentence you to a life sentence in the Colorado Department of Corrections without the possibility of parole. The court is going to award you 883 days of pre-sentence confinement credit for the record. As it relates to count number two, the court is going to impose a consecutive life sentence for the conviction of murder in the first degree as it involves Ms. Frank. As it relates to counts three and four, the class three felonies of tampering with their deceased human bodies, the court is going to impose for each count 12 years in the Colorado Department of Corrections. And while you will not be paroled with regard to those class three felonies, for the record, that carries an additional mandatory parole period of three years. Each of those counts are going to run consecutive. And finally, with regard to counts five and six, for tampering with physical Evidence, a class six felony, the court is going to also impose the maximum sentence of 18 months in the Colorado Department of Corrections, followed by an additional mandatory parole period of one year. So for the record, all six counts are running consecutively to one another. Essentially, the court is going to sentence you to back-to-back -to -back life sentences, followed by an additional sentence of 27 years. While this is somewhat academic, the court is going to order that you pay all other statutorily required conditions, including financial obligations, and provide the prosecutor 
30 days to file any additional requests for restitution in this case. And we are in recess. And for those of you who are leaving again today, we offer our condolences on behalf of the state of Colorado. And I also wish once again to thank the jurors in this case for their hard work and dedication um, in reaching their decision. We are in recess. Good luck to you.